You can't design a curriculum till you know what it's for. A curriculum is a means to an end, and if you're not clear about what your ends are, then you flounder with the construction of a curriculum. It seems to me that some clarity, real clarity, about the question that the Nuffield Review asked, for example, what do we want an educated 11-year-old or 18-year-old or 19-year-old to be like demands real close attention because a curriculum is a means to that end. And if we don't have a clear, uh, detailed, well-debated description of what we want our young people to be, and that it includes, Tim is quite right, knowledge, but also skills, attitudes, and values. If we're not clear about that, then we flounder around and we treat curriculum and assessment as if they were some kind of technical matters, rather than matters that are constantly needing to be referred back to a kind of moral primary of what it was we said we wanted. From my point of view, and this won't surprise you, uh, it seems to me that the core of the curriculum should be about not just about grades, and Tim would agree with me on this, not just about grades, and not just about a preparation for further study, but a richer, more appropriate 21st century based uh, notion of preparing young people with the attitudes, the values, the knowledge, and the skills that they need to function with confidence and competence in a world that is full of opportunity and risk and trickiness and turbulence and so on. These things are cliches. Specifically, I think we need to unpack uh, as clearly as we can what it means to be able to do well when faced with uncertainty, confusion, or complexity. It seems that there is a, a core set of challenges to young people. Uh, very nicely articulated in the title of a, a very important book by Robert Keegan from Harvard, which was, was called In Over Our Heads, The Mental Demands of Modern Life. And if you unpack those, they are uh, incredibly uh, difficult and substantial, much more than perhaps 50 years ago. And for me, the, the curriculum needs to start from addressing those issues, as of course it needs to start from addressing a whole set of different values. We, I would want to be quite unapologetic about saying I want to be in the business of trying to produce young people who prefer kindness to cruelty, who prefer honesty to deceit who prefer moral courage to a kind of lily-livered or weaselly expediency, which we see a lot of on our screens at the moment. So I think getting some clarity about that is absolutely vital before we can begin to talk about what should be in the curriculum. And the curriculum is the large conglomeration of means and methods which we construct to the best of our ability, on the best of the evidence that we have, with the greatest plausibility, that we say there's a strong likelihood that these means and methods will deliver on those outcomes. And then, of course, along with that goes not just assessment of pupils, but constant, meticulous, honest monitoring of the success with which our means are delivering on our ends, a constant evaluation of the system. So principled curriculum design for me means careful construction of a whole constellation of methods and media which we anticipate or hope or with good reason will lead to those outcomes. And that includes subject matter, the construction of activities, the quality of relationships, the role models which are offered, the way we construct groupings, and the methods of quality control which, as we know only too well, back drive the nature of what goes on in classrooms and what goes on in learning. Each of these elements has to have the strongest rationale possible, and they have to be knitted together with as strong a, ra a rationale as possible. And for me, it's very important that when we talk about the design of a curriculum, that is we don't default to a concern with subject matter or difficult concepts 
or core constructs, but we also concern ourselves with the, uh, with the, the wider uh, attitudes that we want to cultivate and with the powerful role as if you've read Dylan Williams' pamphlet, you would, uh, uh, in the Redesigning Schooling series, uh, as I have recently, the, the powerful role, the intrinsic essential role of the need to think carefully about pedagogy as an even more important element of that mix of methods which contributes to the development of the outcomes that we said we valued. In Dylan's pamphlet, he quotes uh, from uh, an, a, a cu curriculum developer, Hilda Tabber, in the, writing in the 1960s. Um, and I'm going to quote uh, this again because I think it puts its finger on something very important, which I think perhaps is a little under-acknowledged in Tim's analysis. The selection of content does not of itself develop the desired techniques and skills of thinking, doesn't change patterns of attitude or feeling, doesn't produce academic and social skills. These objectives can only be achieved by the way in which learning experiences are planned and conducted in the classroom. In other words, by pedagogy. How you teach, uh, uh, as I think we perhaps would all agree, is more important than what you teach, particularly in the context of those wider skills or competences which should sit at the heart of our aspirations for the 21st century curriculum. Nevertheless, you do have to have content. Of course you do. This opposition, as Tim quite rightly said, between content and process is completely bogus. It's a cheap way of shallow thinking government ministers trying to rubbish a concern with the wider skills agenda. Of course you need interesting and challenging things to think about and to work on. But you need to look at that content matter in the light of what kinds of mental training activities do those contents afford. For example, David Perkins at Harvard talks about the importance of wild topics. If you want to create youngsters who are able to think on their feet, to be flexible in their thinking, you need to give them topics that require them to cope with uncertainty, to be flexible, to deal with difficulty, and so on, not merely to work their way through topics that have been planned and overworked umpteen times before. Things have to defend their place in the curriculum. And my principles, my criteria, are a little different from Tim's. I think there are things that are inherently useful for all, which build their confidence. For example, in a recent workshop with some primary school children, they were asked what they wanted from their school curriculum. And somewhat to the dismay of most of us in the room, one of the overwhelming things they said they wanted was self-defense. And their teacher said, all right then, will lay on some self-defense classes for you at school. It seems to me that is entirely appropriate and legitimate. If things are not inherently useful, then we, they could defend their place in the curriculum, and the conservation of mass might be such a candidate, on the basis that studying them and grappling with them do develop. Uh, mental habits and attitudes which are really useful. But you have to work quite hard to say why is studying uh, Mark Antony's speech in Shakespeare's Julius and C Julius Caesar a better way of looking at moral courage or moral pusillanimity than studying the court transcripts of the trials of Andy Coulson and Rebecca Brooks, for example. We need to be having those conversations and not simply accepting things as being venerable. And of course, there's a role for cultural treasures, but that shouldn't be used merely as a perpetuation of things which have traditionally served the basis of a kind of middle-class erudition. Without these ever-present ever principles, curriculum becomes unprincipled. It becomes driven merely by knowledge for knowledge's sake, grades for grades' sake, obsessing about some of the more naive and superficial aspects of PISA league tables and so on. I'm reminded of a quotation from La Rochefoucauld who defined a fanatic as someone who redoubles their efforts 
when they have forgotten what they're fighting for. And I fear that we have some fanatics involved in the control of education at the moment. And I think if we're going to take a principled view to the design of curriculum, we need first to take a deep breath and go back into that difficult but absolutely vital moral conversation about what are the desired outcomes for young people in the real world of the 21st century and start from there. Thank you.